questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nitin, for allowing me to be a part of this. And I must compliment his uh, sustained efforts to convince us that uh, LASIK is uh, still a good option. No financial interest, but it would be nice to have some. Uh, in a place where we are living in terms of myopia, the amount of myopia is actually increasing. Uh, and Western population, it's about 25%. But while you'll be surprised in some places in China uh, and in Singapore and Taiwan, it's close to about 90%. And at least in India too, uh, and that's what we're seeing in our practice, the amount of myopia has consistently gone up. And there are multiple interventions for uh, uh, myopia. You could do a corneal ablation, you could do corneal additions, you could do corneal relaxation procedures, and there is, of course, lenticle refractive surgery. For patients with moderate to high degrees of myopia, patients with thin corneas, the eczema laser refractive surgery may be slightly less predictable and less safe. There have been multiple uh, complications that have been discussed with respect to flap, but remember that flap creation itself induces aberrations. You do it with a keratome or you do it with a femtosecond laser. And do we need options beyond LASIK, especially in thinner corneas, for corrections beyond minus 10 or plus 4? They are limited by the, the uh, corneal thickness and the quality of vision, especially for higher diopteric corrections, is affected. There are increased higher order aberrations. There are, of course, flap complications. We did a study about eight, nine years back when we looked at Indian eyes in terms of what are the higher order aberrations, and we found them to be about 0 0.28 microns in a healthy set of populations. And you looked at the Q values in these Asian patients or Indian patients, they were basically for higher myopes, it is a slightly flatter cornea. And how does that really affect the way we approach? We did a study further, extending the study where we looked at mild and moderate myopias, and we compared them with a nomogram which was for plano LASIK, and we looked at how, if you use an aspheric uh, correction for LASIK, how would it actually differ? We looked at best corrected visual activity, we looked at contrast sensitivity, and we also looked at pre- and pooperative Q values. Q value is a change in the asphericity of the cornea after surgery. And of what we, of course, did find for moderate and mild myopias, there is a lesser change, and you actually tend to maintain the Q value compared to the plano LASIK, and this reflects in the way the patient perceives the vision. Uh, the Q change after surgery matched both the age and the amount of myopia, and the Q value was significantly more for the plano LASIK, which did not use the nomogram of the machine. An example, if you have a high myope with minus 7, and you have a Q value of 0 0.19, after surgery, it would be a very flat cornea, and the patient would perceive it with poor quality of vision. We had concluded in that study that Q-adjusted aspheric profiles are ideal for patients with moderate to high myopes, but a significant change in Q-value occurs even after low to moderate myopes. Hence, now the question is, what would you have an option when you're comparing fakic lenses with wavefront-guided LASIK? Just a short video, just to show that it is not that invasive and it is not that major a procedure, though it is an intraocular procedure and, and precautions with respect to what you would do for a normal intraocular procedure would definitely be required. The procedure, if it's planned well and executed, does not take more than 15 to 20 minutes per eye. You can do bilateral ICLs, that has been done in some uh, centers across uh, US and Canada, but ideally you need to do do a space out, usually about a couple of days. So the procedure, is, of course, doesn't take more than 15 minutes. Uh, the procedure is fairly standardized, and with an uh, a experience of about 10 patients, you can definitely have reproducible and clarity of results. Uh, this is one patient post-op three years post-keratoplasty in which I did an ICL before significant amyotropia, and the patient after now four years still sees six by six. There are some abrasions post-operatively, and in, in this patient with significant number of astigmatism, this is with the Hoya eye trace, you can make out that post-operatively it looks a lot better. And this is what the evidence also starts suggests. There is something that called the Cochrane Collaboration, and there's something I would recommend that you read, which was published about four years, uh, now six years back, where they compared eczymer and phacic lenses. And it's been published in the Cornea Journal, where they found, and they looked at the meta-analysis of all major published results of uh, LASIK versus ICL. And what they found was that in terms of efficacy of the procedure, it is actually similar. You have uncorrected vision, and this is pure Snellens alone at about six by six. In terms of accuracy, 
the sixth, six months and the 12 month outcomes were almost similar too. What was important was in terms of contrast sensitivity, remember we are doing it for younger patients who are going to be active and who are going to dry, they found that in terms of safety outcomes and contrast sensitivity, the phacic lenses where you do not touch the cornea, it was better. For higher myopes, you have a loss of best corrected vision and phacic IOL was less likely to use the, lose the preoperative pre uh, best corrected vision. So they did mention that in terms of percentage, percentage of eyes achieving 20 by 20, it is similar, but phacic IOLs maybe also have a slightly higher chance of developing a cataract. But phacic IOLs are safer in terms of loss of best corrected vision, better contrast sensitivity, and higher patient satisfaction, and this is something that they concluded. We did a small study of about 60 uh, eyes in the wafer guided group and in about 30 eyes in the ICL group for more low to high myopes, and we also looked at high order abrasions and looked at contrast sensitivity, and we found that in terms of contrast sensitivity alone, even for low to moderate myopes where the ablation patterns are less, the contrast sensitivity is better for ICL. Uh, we have done uh, ICLs even in keratoconus, and we have almost now eight year follow-ups, and we looked at the amount of correction, there is stability in the correction even on follow-up. Uh, we had concluded in terms of uh, uh, the four and six million of pupils, there are some ocular third and fourth order abrasions which are significantly less than a wafering guided LASIK and the post-op contrast sensitivity was also better after ICL implantation. This is broadly my paradigm in terms of how I manage patients. If it's low to moderate myopia, you have a regular astigmatism, high, uh, high order abrasions, you, you would consider a fake lens. You can do a wafering guided procedure. If you got low astigmatism and low high order abrasions, consider a wafer and optimized treatment. There are of course other considerations in terms of corneal thickness, anterior chamber depth, and intraocular procedure versus the patient occupation. In conclusion, correction of patients with thin corneas for more mild to moderate uh, high myopes, ICL is a good option. It improves the visual performance in patients with high amounts of astigmatism, pre-existing high order abrasions, and for low to moderate myopia with suspected topography, it would be a good option in patients not eligible for LASIK. Thank you so much.